It's my pleasure today to be interviewing Professor Melinda Hall of Michigan State University. Melinda is joining us at the Edinburgh Law School under the McCormick Visiting Scholarship Program. And we set this program up a few years ago in memory of our, of our much missed and much loved former colleague, Sir Neil McCormick, who was a real linchpin of the community here at the Edinburgh Law School for many years. He was an internationally resigned legal scholar I also had the privilege to be taught by Neil when I was a, a student in first year, so I have very fond personal memories of him. And every year we try and bring a number of scholars from around the world to Edinburgh Law School to come and do some intensive research here at Edinburgh University and really to share some of what they are doing with us. So in the spirit of sharing what Melinda is doing with us, I thought I'd get her here this morning and ask her a few questions. So I suppose my first uh, introductory question, Melinda, is how are you finding your time here so far at the Edinburgh Law School? Well, wonderful, of course, and it's such an honor and privilege to be here, um, especially among such, uh, you know, really world-recognized scholars. Um, so I'm learning a lot, um, as well as um, being able to do my own work, so it's been lovely. Fantastic. Well, we're very happy to have you here with us. Can you just explain a little bit about what the sort of main research is that you're doing here in Edinburgh? Um, I'm particularly interested in how judges exercise discretion. And we don't typically think of judges as political actors or um, really in terms of decision makers beyond weighing evidence and reading law. And of course they do that, but there are occasions when judges do have discretion and understanding how judges structure that discretion is an important focus of political science. And so that's what I'm doing. Right. And I suppose the public perception of the way that the judges operate in the US and the UK is probably a little bit different, isn't it? I mean, can you tell us how you think judges are perceived differently in the UK from, from the US? Um, yes, very differently. Um, judges are viewed in much more political terms in the United States. For example, we've just watched the appointment of a United States Supreme Court justice. And that was intensely political. And part of the discussion was about how that justice would shift the ideological outputs of the institution. And we just don't have those conversations here. And in fact, um, the courts in the US do probably have more discretion, particularly uh, on the issues uh, related to the constitutional con constitution, constitutional interpretation. Um, but that doesn't mean that all judges don't have some level of discretion. Uh, we have courts to answer these fundamental differences about what the law means or ambiguities and so forth. So I, I certainly don't think that courts here have the same political profile, but it still might be useful to examine what they're doing and try to understand um, yeah. how they make decisions. Yeah, the nearest I think in the UK we've got to the world of politics intruding into the world of, of judges and the way they operate was probably in the Supreme Court's Brexit case mm. in the UK. And that came with a lot of, for I think for British people, quite uncomfortable comments in some of the press about the perceived political opinions and backgrounds of some of our judges. And the British public, I think, found that quite uncomfortable, whereas I suppose America, the American public are probably very used to that, aren't they? Yes, it's just normal conversation. And to be clear, I, I want to be specific about what I mean by politics and yep. discussion. I certainly don't mean to suggest that judges are biased, that you know they have a pro pr particular you know predilection for the accused versus the the crown or or something along those lines, or they're members of the Labour Party, so they will decide cases accordingly. It's more that um, there is ambiguity in the law, and somehow judges have to decide those ambiguities. Yeah. And in doing so, judges frequently draw on their own philosophies, on um, their backgrounds, their um, life experiences. There's nothing illegitimate about it at all. It's simply a human endeavor in the absence of perfect information. Yeah. And so that's what I mean. I'm certainly not suggesting judges are overtly political actors or engage in anything illicit or illegitimate or or even something as basic as personal bias. Right. I mean, is there much more of a tradition in the US of scrutinizing judicial uh, decision making 
and perhaps using different techniques for doing that than one would find in, in the UK, do you think? Um, so far, but that's changing. And again, part of it relates to the way the courts actually function. So the United States Supreme Court has extraordinary discretion in a lot of the cases it decides. Cases are there because the law isn't certain and they have to resolve uh, those questions. Um, so nonetheless, um, about a third or even more, depending on the term, of those decisions are unanimous. So no matter how divergent the ideologies or political preferences or judicial philosophies, whichever you know, term you're most comfortable with, um, how important they are, still those judges agree, which would suggest that law is very important. But that court does have a great deal of discretion, and probably the leading theory of how they structure that discretion is what's called the attitudinal model, which simply suggests their personal preferences right. are the way those judges make decisions. I don't think you would see either that kind of discretion or that kind of thinking in the UK. But it doesn't mean that there aren't systematic factors that we can identify that might help us understand what judges do. For example, does gender matter? Do women judges decide cases differently, all things being equal, than men judges? Things like that. But I, again, I don't think the, a, a theory that would say judges in UK courts simply vote their ideology uh, would have um, very much uh, explanatory power, and in fact, um, Chris Henretti, um, a UK scholar, a very fine UK scholar, tested that idea using the, the UK law lords um, and uh, didn't find any support uh, for that notion at all. Right. I mean, the Scottish judges probably aren't used to scholars looking so closely at their decision making. Did you find there was any reticence in the Scottish court service to, to, for you to approach them and, and carry out this work, or did you find that they were very open about their decision making and their giving access to their, to their data. Well, interesting enough, I did think it was rather impertinent to contact the court and ask them to talk about uh, what they do and how they do it, but they were remarkably open. Uh, the level of transparency in the court is admirable. Um, I actually met with uh, the Lord Justice General, Lord Justice Clark, a number of people in justiciary, which was my uh, uh, first focus, the High Court and criminal appeals and they provided access to the unpublished decisions. They spoke with me freely, and so it's, it's been a pleasure. I'm very glad to hear that. As you get further into your research, are you, are you already thinking that you're beginning to uncover some traits or some tendencies, and what do you hope at the end of the research, your research will show scholars in the, in the UK and the US? Well, there are two primary questions I'm asking. The first is, does gender seem to um, matter in the sense that do we see differences between men and women on the high court in the way they um, decide criminal appeals? And the second question is this idea of haves versus have-nots. This is a very big topic in political science. Um, there um, has been work that suggests that litigation, in fact, is very much biased toward the haves not because the judges themselves are biased, but simply because of resource asymmetries, that you know, uh, organizations, um, businesses, governments have far more resources, more knowledge. Um, they um, repeat um, their um, you know, uh, um, um, attendance in courts, and individuals don't have those resources. Mm -hmm. And so there's... Uh, quite a bit of work across the world, actually, assessing this question of whether the have-nots are inherently disadvantaged. So those are the two questions I've asked. Um, prelimin uh, preliminary evidence, very yep. preliminary, suggests that there may be some gender differences in the court. And again, I want to be very careful what that means. It doesn't mean the judges are biased. Uh, it means that occasionally when they have discretion, we might see differences between the way panels of women decide the cases, for example, uh, relative to panels of men. Right. And so that's an exciting finding, and, uh, and it comports very well with what we see in numerous other courts around the world. The other interesting finding 
is that in Scotland, in the High Court anyway, um, on criminal appeals, doesn't seem to manifest this distinct preference for haves over have-nots. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, the accused win more often than not, if we want to use that terminology yep. uh, with litigation. Um, and in fact, if you look at players, again, a term you would see in US work, of who the power players are, we would think it would be the crown. So the prosecution always has advantages over the accused. But in fact, if we look at the cases, when the crown brings cases to the court, they're not more likely to win than lose. And the real power player, if we want to uh, identify one, is really the Scottish uh, sentence, Sentencing Commission. Um, because when they refer cases, and they don't do it often, but when they do re refer cases, they're more likely to, to win those cases. And so it would suggest that Scotland is actually quite different and these challenges to the idea of courts being open and you know everyone having an equal probability of winning and accessing the courts uh, seems to fit Scotland quite well when it doesn't fit uh, numerous other courts and countries around the world. Well, it sounds like Scotland might come out rather well out of your analysis, which is good to hear. <laughs> yes. um, we wish you all the best with the Thank rest you. of your research. It's delightful to have you here, and we look forward to reading the, f the, the final outputs of your studies here in Scotland. So good luck with the rest of your work. And thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. You're welcome.